Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, or wherever you are. Welcome to Foxtrot Alpha Aviation, your source for level up flight simulation. Welcome back to Foxtrot Alpha Aviation. This is episode two. I hope you had a great week. I had an interesting week, including a flight to Vancouver in the Challenger, and I ended off the week with a flight in the simulator doing night flying. During the day that uh, I did the flying, I woke up early in the morning and I found out that it was minus 43 degrees Celsius outside. So I headed into work and it was foggy conditions, ice fog conditions, but I landed in Vancouver and it was, uh, well, it was about five degrees, which for some people would be pretty chilly, but it was quite fantastic for me as I got out of my minus 43 condition. Anyways, uh, spent the night there and then I did a flight back the next day and uh, everything was great. Today's show topic is going to be how do you, as a flight simulator pilot, use simbrief.com as a flight planning tool? Why would you need a tool? Well, there's many different reasons. My first one I'm going to tell you is to level up your flight simulation. But flight planning is a key thing in aviation. It is kind of the foundation of the thing that you learn when you're becoming a pilot, of learning about navigation, meteorology, and all the other topics. It's all, everything all combined into one thing. Some of you out there want to create the most realistic flight simulation that you possibly can. Maybe you have some destinations in mind. Maybe they're close places. Maybe they're far off destinations or whatever you have in mind. There is a way to make it more realistic, and that is to create a flight plan using simbrief.com. What it actually allows you to do is to create a real world looking flight plan package that we would use either in corporate aviation, in my case, or in airline world. Every airline in the world has their own type of package and how it's designed. And with the simbrief.com free system, you can create your own package that you like as well. So we'll be looking at the different kind of tools that are available to us to make our flight simulation more realistic and to, again, level up our simulation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into simbrief and create a flight plan and choose the routing that I want, choose the amount of passengers that I would like to have, payload, fuel. I can allow the system to help me with it, or I can make it my own choosing how I want it to be done. But essentially, in the end, I'm going to have a package in a PDF form that's going to be able to show me exactly what I'm going to need for the flight. So what is Simbrief? Simbrief is a free program that is available to anyone. And all you have to do is go to their website and sign up for it. So once you reach simbrief.com, the first thing you want to do is create yourself a free user account. So you're going to create a username, you know, whatever it may be, um, your password, confirm your password, put your first name and your last name. These can be fake names. So this is your chance to be you know, Captain Cool or whatever you want to be. And then you your real world email. You have to agree to the terms of service, the privacy policy, and the cookie statement. Essentially, Simbrief needs to know that you're not going to use this in real life. And it's for simulator purposes only. Once you've done that, you're going to get an email. You need to confirm your email registration and through the activation link. And once that is done, then now you're a full fledge member of Simbrief. So once we get on to the program itself, we head over to simbrief.com, we log in, and we have a number of options available to us. The first one is going to be the home page, and the home page is going to be about, register, dispatch, help, and support. So each one of these tabs are going to have information that uh, will drop down into a menu. So general information about aircraft types, the partner websites, um, so how to support Simbrief, so I'm not going to go through exactly everything about Simbrief. I really just want to let you know that it's available to you. There's a lot of brand new flight simmers out there, and they are very interested in doing the most accurate thing possible. And that's what I'm here to help you with. So going to Simbrief is going to be kind of the first things you want to do. Get your set up with an account. You can either make it easy for yourself or we can get really, really complicated and, and get into the nitty gritty. I am going to get into 
basics on how to use it, but they have their own amazing tutorial video, which I'd highly recommend that you check out. It was made, I believe, in 2016. It's about a 40 minute long video. But if you're if you're invested in this, go check it out because it's going to explain in detail exactly what you're going to need to know to create flight plans in the mo- most realistic manner. Now, af- if after doing that, you have questions, then I certainly want you to come back and ask those questions here. So reconnect with me either through SpeakPipe or onto my website at foxtrotalphaaviation.ca and let me know what your questions are. Reach out and I will find out what I need to find out for you and get back to you. Once you have created an account with SimBrief, you want to come to the Dispatch tab. The Dispatch tab is going to be where you're going to create a new flight. So you're going to see New Flight, Edit Flight, My Briefing, My Flights, which would be Saved Flights from Before, My Fleet, because you can create your own airline, uh, your own aircraft type, and very much customize it for what you want. Database tab is about the air rack cycle. In other words, the navigation cycle that's currently in use. If you don't pay to have uh, the air rack cycle updated, then you will probably have a slightly outdated database. There's a in-depth user guide, and then there's also a My Account, which is going to be information about your account that you've already set up. So today we're going to do uh, a new flight, and we're going to get an OFP summary page, and we're going to we're going to set in. I'll click New Flight. My, at the very, very top, I've got flight information, so I can put in the airline that I want, the flight number, where I'm going to depart from, where I'm going to go to, and I can either pick an alternate or it will automatically select one for me the date and the departure time in Zulu, the airframe type or the aircraft type. So I can click ones that I've already created. So in my case, I have quite a few that I've made. So I've got the longitude, the citation CJ4. I have a Boeing 747 from other simulators. This is cross simulator possible. So if you have an X-Plane system, that's awesome. You can use it on here. You have prepared Microsoft Flight Simulator, you can use this for anything and it it is highly versatile. So once we've looked at those, we can look at our different aircraft options so we can choose a climb profile. I recommend as a brand new user, leave things in auto, Um, leave things like the, the climb profile, the cruise profile, the descent profile, things like the fuel factor, which we'll talk about down the road. Registrations automatically are going to get filled in through the aircraft type, fin number, and other more complex things like SoCal. So if you're brand new, the minimum things you need to add here is your departure aerodrome, where you're going to, an alternate, the date and the time, and the airplane that you want to fly. Again, you can create your own aircraft or you can use the custom setup that they have there. So if you want to pick an Airbus A320, for example, you click on Airbus A320 and then comes into the optional entries Normally, these are automatically calculated, but they can be overridden. And then you'll have dispatch information. And then again, the air act cycle, which is the navigation data, routing. And let's say you have absolutely no idea what kind of route you want to pick. So you can go to the, the route finder. You can put in the route that you want to plan. So if I'm going to go from Edmonton to Kelowna, for example, I'm going to use SimBrief and I'm going to pick a routing that may have been flown before, or maybe it's a custom one. And that's really all you have to do to get the basic information down. It really should take you, you know, a matter of maybe two minutes to get a flight plan going once you've got things set up. Once you've done that, you're going to hit generate OFP, operational flight plan. And that is where we're going to start getting into the nitty gritty of today's discussion. So the nitty gritty of today's discussion is about looking at the flight plan, all of the numbers and all of the the coding that is used on a flight plan, because that's how we're really going to level up our flight simulation. And I've started understanding that we just do not jump into an aircraft, you know, light the fires and go. There's a lot of planning that's involved. In an airline environment, a lot of the planning is done for us and we just show up. We grab the package that we're talking about and you may have seen in, you know, movies and that kind of thing where they they show up to a briefing room and they go up to the dot matrix printer and it prints a mile long 
uh, package for them, well, that's pretty realistic. In real life, in the airline world, you know, either head to a printer, grab the package, we'd head over to a website and grab a PDF and then print it off at our location that we're at. Because potentially you could be, you know, anywhere that the airline flies and you have to have access to a computer and to the ability to have um, a printout or even in the good old days, and I'm sure still happening in the north now is that they're actually faxed over to the location and then given to the crew members as they arrive. Okay, so we've gone through and we talked about SimBrief. We have set up ourselves an account. We've looked at the user guide. We've checked out the user tutorial, which I highly recommend. And at that point, if you have any questions, ask them again through SpeakPipe, go to the website and ask the questions. Do not be shy. We all started out at the beginning. So assuming you've done that and you have generated an OFP, which is basically a a PDF package, you're going to have a lot of pages to look at. So there's probably going to be in the neighborhood of 30 to 50 pages. And you're like, well, I'm not going to read 30 to 50 pages to go flight simming. Fair enough. But what I do want you to look at, though, is that we're going to we're going to have a look at essentially page one through probably the first five pages, one through five. Depending on the system that you're using, you're going to have the information about where you're going, you're going from and to. Uh, there's going to be cruise information, what mock speed you're going to be flying at, the distance you're going to be flying at, the average wind. So the this will be the average cruise wind that you're going to be flying at, the average wing component. So if it's going to be a plus or a minus, the average ISA temperature, and we're going to be talking about that today. As, just as an example, I grabbed a flight uh, the I did the other day, which was a really interesting flight because I went from Houston Intercontinental George Bush KIAH Airport, which was about minus 13 degrees Celsius and snow. Think about that. Snow, lots and lots of snow and power outs and that kind of thing. I've headed from KIAH to Kilo Charlie Hotel Alpha, which is Chattanooga, Tennessee. And why I picked that, I don't really know, but I have been there before. I thought it was kind of a cool airport. So the the flight went from, again, KIAH to Chattanooga, and we're in the Cessna CJ4, Cessna Citation CJ4, and uh, we f- we're flying a distance of 705 nautical miles, so it was quite a long flight. Um, it was very snowy conditions in Houston, as it was realistically yesterday and the day before. Very cold temperature, really bad weather. Definitely wanted to go somewhere warmer. So I went from the next flight I went was from Chattanooga down to Key West. So I definitely got out of the cold and into the heat. The only issue there was is that I ended up landing uh, at night, which um, which is definitely fine, but um, very unfamiliar area for me. Lots of hazards in the Keys, including military operations areas. There's um, things like suspended balloons out over the ocean that they're surveillance type balloons. Very interesting stuff, but something you definitely don't want to be hitting. So I really found the flight interesting. It went from a cold area to a very warm area. There was no step climbing involved. I went up to 41,000 feet, flight level 410, kind of right off the bat. And so the actual flight didn't take a long time. It was only, you know, an hour and 20 minutes, I believe. So starting off here, we have a whole bunch of information, but we have our trip fuel, contingency fuel, our alternate, which is Miami. And all of that amount of fuel was 3,780 pounds of fuel. The plan was to climb from Chattanooga all the way up to flight level 410, kind of right off the bat. If we look at the flight plan itself, it's very realistic. It's got, it even has things like the the captain, which is you. It has the dispatcher's name. It has um, a whole bunch of operational impact information. So maybe there is uh, MEL items, some minimum equipment list items or uh, equipment that's no longer operating on your plane and it may, might affect your flight. And, you know, that's highly detailed information, which we can talk about another time. On my particular flight, I only had four passengers. I had 176 pounds of cargo, and we had about 3,780 pounds once the fuel truck left of fuel. We had our actual flight log. It's a very detailed sheet that shows point to point to point to point. And in real life, uh, in my aircraft, we actually 
upload this through a computer or through our FMC. Our flight planning program shows up in, in our FMS and we have to verify our printed out package of about mm, probably seven or eight sheets of paper, uh, verifying that all the, the points that we are in fact cleared to are actually in the FMS and are part of the flight plan. And we verify that circling each point. So in my particular example, I can see we're departing level field, Kilo Charlie Hotel Alpha. We're going to reach atop a climb. They were going to go direct Atlanta and then a bunch of waypoints, but Honid, Nikki, Bitney, Endu, Farloo, Ni Lehi, I believe it's Thumper, then a top of descent, and each point along the flight. What we're trying to figure out, even in flight sim, to kind of make it realistic as possible, is we really care about time and we really care about how much fuel. Because in real life, this is really the only way that we would know that we were we have some type of mechanical problem with the aircraft that we're losing fuel. There could be a fuel leak, say in the wing, there could be a fuel leak actually in the engine area itself that we can't see. There could be many different reasons. There could be a, an engine that's not for, performing properly. All these things we want to know is the trip fuel that we're planning actually what we're going to get. And if it's not, well, the numbers are going to show up and we're going to be able to to decide what we want to do. So you've created your first sim brief package. Now what do you do with it? Well, you're going to set up your aircraft just like you have been, but you're going to start looking at the details that are in the package and set things up like your passengers, your cargo, or your payload, and the amount of fuel. If we get those things right, that'll really help us create a more realistic flight simulation experience using the Simbri package. So in my case here, I'm going to look at a flight from Chattanooga, Tennessee to Key West, Florida. I'm going to be using the Citation CJ4, and we're going to be doing a flight that's approximately 705 miles, and it's going to take us a little, approximately an hour and 20 minutes for the flight. We'll be doing that at 41,000 feet. So to start off, we've got our package at hand. I'd highly suggest you print off the first one to five pages so you can follow along. Once you've got that done, we're going to load the aircraft up using our simulation. So we're going to add the passengers in, we're going to add the payload in, and if you look at our trip package, we're going to see block fuel. In this case here, I have 3,662 pounds of fuel. So I'm going to add approximately 3,700 pounds of fuel or thereabouts. And you might consider, you know, in my case here, I had really bad weather at this airport. So I added a couple extra hundred pounds for, for taxiing um, because I was going to be taxiing with my engine uh, anti-ice system on just probably, you know, just to be more safe, I added more fuel. Once you've got that figured out, you know, just add the fuel in, add the passengers, all that information load that all that information into your flight management computer whether it be if you're in the airbus your mcdu the other aircraft in your fms system so once you've got that we now can kind of look at the actual routing so in real life especially in my aircraft this is i load it up directly into my flight management computer and believe it or not you can do the same thing for yourself using simbrief whatever you're going to create in simbrief during your package creation you can import it into the microsoft flight simulator and use it in microsoft flight simulator so we're looking at about page four of the flight plan here now and this shows all the different waypoints in my case, I have quite a few of them. I have Lovell, so the airport that I'm at right now, Kilo Charlie Hotel Alpha, and it's going to have things like how much fuel I have on board. The next thing is going to be top of climb. Next one, in my case, is going to be Atlanta, and they have another location called Honid. And the next thing I'm going to see on the page is going to be the flight information region. So I'm going to be going from Atlanta flight information region or the air traffic control region to the next flight information or the flight air traffic control region, which is Jacksonville. And I'm going to see all the different waypoints in that flight information region. The next one I'm going to see is Miami as I get closer and closer to Key West. And I'm going to have waypoints all along the route. So I'm going to have Lovell, Top of Climb, Atlanta, Honid, Nikki. Bitney, Endu, Farlu, Lehi, 
Themper. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to verify all these waypoints in my flight plan to what I have on the FMS. They must match. And then once I get my air traffic control clearance, whether it be done through Microsoft Flight Simulator or what other program you use, including VATSIM, they should match. What I'm going to use this flight plan for is to determine how much fuel I'm going to have at each point along the route. I'm going to determine how much fuel is on board, how much fuel I've burnt, and what time I'm crossing over the fix. This is going to tell me if I have any issues. Maybe it's mechanical. Maybe I'm leaking fuel, whatever it may be. I can get you to think about some major incidents that have occurred with fuel, especially oceanic operations, including an air transat flight with an A330 that lost a massive amount of fuel. You can check that out on, on YouTube. And you can just see how important it is to monitor fuel. In this airplane, the CJ-4, we don't have tons and tons of fuel. We, we only have, in this particular case, 3,700 approximate pounds of fuel. We don't have like 10,000 pounds of fuel. So we need to be very concerned about how much fuel we're going to be using along the route. If there's any extra being burnt, maybe we're actually making fuel. Because the higher we climb, the more efficient our engines are. We actually might be having more fuel than we had planned over each point. So we're in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We're in the aircraft. We've got our fuel. We've checked everything. We've done all of our checklists. Everything is all complete. The FMS is good to go. We've verified the waypoints. We're going to start up the engines. We're going to then check our time that we are off the blocks at, and we're going to record that into our flight plan. We're going to complete our taxi, and we're going to complete our takeoff. And once we're airborne, we're going to go into our FMS and look at our flight log and record our off time. Our off time is going to be used for calculations throughout the entire flight. So now we're on the runway, we're in Chattanooga, and we're going to think about thrust settings. So in a simulator world, we typically just add the power and away we go. In real life, that's certainly not the case. Typically, an engine at takeoff thrust can only be at takeoff thrust for a period of five minutes maximum. Some operators actually time the takeoff so that they know how long the engines have been at takeoff thrust if there is a, some type of malfunction. An engine can continually run in maximum continuous thrust, or MCT, and that is the setting that we would use specifically in the Challenger if we had an engine out situation and we needed to run the remaining engine at high power or maximum continuous thrust. Cruise speed is generally achieved by reaching the altitude that you're planning to level off at. We'll use flight level 350. We're going to maintain our, our climb engine performance um, set through the ProLine 21 or whatever MCDU or FMS system. In my particular case, the Challenger has an FMS system that we can select our thrust settings using climb and cruise. So by essentially pressing a button, we're going to be able to change the N1 parameter for N1 cruise or N1 climb. So if I'm at 35,000 feet and I want to climb higher, I'm actually going to set my out select to a higher altitude, go into my performance, set higher climb N1, increase the thrust, and then climb up. Typically, in aircraft such as the Hawker, uh, we would climb up to our cruise altitude. It would actually leave the thrust at our climb setting for a number of minutes, actually, to allow the aircraft to speed up to our desired cruise mock. Once we reach the cruise mock, then we'd bring the thrust back and we would set it to whatever uh, required for, for the flight. In the case of the Challenger, we climb up to our cruise altitude, in this case, flight level 350, and we leave the aircraft performance or leave the FMS thrust settings into climb until we reach our cruise mock. And then we call for our cruise checks. And at that point, there's a flow that's done by the pilot not flying, which is going to put the aircraft into a cruise performance parameter. And we're going to make sure that everything is operating properly. Kind of the first thing that we do is the top of climb fuel. So the aircraft is climbing up. And in my case, it took about 12 minutes to get up to our cruising altitude of 41,000 feet. And I flew that at 0.64 Mach. I had about 628 pounds of fuel burn to get there. So I would compare that actual number with what I have on my flight plan and decide if that's an acceptable number or not. 
Then, as we cross each waypoint along the flight plan for the next one, for example, the next one was Atlanta, Alpha, Tango, Lima, or the VOR, uh, with a lat and long. At that point now, I've sped up. I'm doing Mach decimal 0.76, and I had burned 746 pounds of fuel. And then I crossed the VOR at a specific time, and I would confirm that time to what I have on my flight plan to ensure that everything is going correctly. And I'm going to do this all the way down to Key West. So every single time I cross a waypoint, like the ones we just talked about, Atlanta, Honid, Nikki, all the way down, we're going to be checking the fuel burn and the time. We're also going to be noting things like what is our our current wind, what is our current ice temperature, and any other deficiencies that we may have. So that gives you an idea of what I might use a flight plan package for in Flight Simulator. So whether you're in a Citation jet or you're in a Airbus A32NX or a 747 or whatever aircraft you have, flight planning is a really important thing. And SimBrief allows us to mimic real life as possible. We don't talk about it very much in simulation, but temperature is a really important thing. And it plays a huge role in what flight level might be best for our flight. In aviation, everything is referred to as the ISA temperature. 15 degrees Celsius at sea level is standard. The standard lapse rate is 2 degrees per thousand feet. So every thousand feet that you climb, you're losing 2 degrees approximately in temperature. And at sea level, the standard temperature is 15 degrees, 29.92 inches of mercury, or 1013.2 millibars. One of the things that um, you may notice as a Cessna pilot or flight sim pilot is that we don't have an outside air temperature gauge on a jet. We do, but we just don't call it that. So at altitude, we would read our outside air temperature as SAT, S-A-T, saturated air temperature. If we want to be cruising at a mock speed, in other words, we're going to be flying very, very quickly, so fast that we're actually going to have what they call ram rise. And that ram rise is, a, is actually a, a temperature that is increasing inside of the instrument, which is going to cause an air. So the TAT, or the total air temperature, is going to be what we're going to use as the most accurate temperature at high altitude and at high speed. So outside air temperature is going to be SAT, and our performance information, our performance calculations are most likely going to be TAT. So when we're in cruise, and we're in altitude of, say, 30,000 feet or flight level 300, we have to determine what our current temperature is compared to ISA temperature. And why would we want to do that? We have to determine, is our current outside air temperature compared to ISA going to allow us to safely climb to our next altitude? If we willy-nilly just decide we're at X altitude and we want to continue to climb because maybe we got a big headwind or whatever it may be, that might not be a safe action. Because if we continue to climb and we're too heavy, even though we have great big massive turbofan engines outside, they may not have enough oomph or power to get us to where we want to, to a higher cruise altitude in a safe manner. We really do need to know what the performance is. One of the things we need to look at is, what is the standard temperature for a given altitude that I'm at? So, for example, a rule of thumb would be to double the altitude, subtract 15, and place a minus sign in front of it. So, for example, to find ISA temperature at 10,000 feet, we multiply the altitude by 2 to get 20, then we subtract 15 to get 5, and finally we add a minus sign in the front of it to get minus 5. We can do this for pretty much any altitude. This will tell us what our altitude temperature should be for ISA. And now we're going to have a, a temperature that will be higher or lower of that temperature. And that will be ISA plus or ISA minus, And that will determine what our performance is going to be required. So this may sound like a little bit of rocket science for flight simulator use, but it's just a good idea to know what the standard temperature would be at the altitude that you're going to fly. Today's modern turbofan engines are amazing. 
but are limited in the amount of thrust that they can produce compared to the weight of the aircraft and the altitude that the pilot decides to fly at based on an ice at temperature deviation. In a real-world flight example, a flight leaving from Vancouver to Hawaii might not be able to cruise at its top level right away. It may need to burn off some fuel, and burning off fuel is going to reduce the overall weight of the aircraft. Unless it burns that fuel off, it simply cannot climb up to the altitude that the pilot or the flight planner desired them to be at. And this may put you into very undesirable wind conditions. So a pilot has to decide, can they climb up or they have to stay at the altitude that they're going to be at? One of the things you really need to know is your aircraft performance can meet a safety margin that will allow you to climb up to your next desired altitude and give enough thrust to be able to do that safely and reach the cruise speed that you want. So let's say we're cruising at 30,000 feet and we're getting really bad headwinds and we want to climb up to 35,000 feet. We have to ask ourselves, how much does the aircraft weigh at this present time? So we're going to look at our current fuel that we have on board. Go into your FMS, your CDU, determine the amount of fuel that you currently have on board. Make sure your perfinit has been updated, and then you can determine how much the aircraft weighs. In a real life, we're going to pull out a chart and determine if the aircraft is able to climb up to that altitude and then cruise at our desired Mach speed. There'd be no point in order to climb up to XYZ altitude, in this case flight level 350, and not be able to cruise at our desired speed. We might as well just stay down there and take the headwind. And it might not be safe either because we may be getting into a situation where maybe on the low side of the stall buffet margin. So having been looking at the sim brief package that we talked about before, we can see that we have an average wind component. So in this case, the flight that I was taking between Chattanooga down to Key West, I have a average wind component of 224 at 98. So 224 degrees is the compass heading that uh, my wind is going to be coming from and 98 knots. So quite a bit of wind, 224 at 98. So my average wind component uh, in this case is minus 54, meaning that I have a tailwind of 54 knots. So it's going to get me down to Key West much quicker and have an average ISA temperature for our entire flight of plus three. So remember we talked about ISA temperature. So in this case here, I'm going to have a plus three ISA temperature and I will have to go to my chart and determine that plus three is going to allow me at my given current weight, allow me to climb up to the next altitude that I want to go to. So if I'm stuck down at 350 or correction 300 and I want to climb to 350, I've got to determine what temperature is it from an ISO deviation point of view and then make a decision if I'm going to climb or maintain my current altitude. With your sim brief package in hand, you're going to have a, a look at all the different fuel burns and times, and you may decide that you're actually making fuel. So for example, if I'm at over Atlanta at flight level 410 at Mach decimal 76, and I'm supposed to have 2,851 pounds of fuel on board, but I actually have 3034, 3,034 pounds well, I'm, I'm making fuel. And if I go way down the flight plan, I can see at a location called Bitney, I'm supposed to have 1883 pounds on board, but in fact, I had 2300 pounds. So in this case here, I'm doing way better than my flight plan fuel is showing. So I can actually go into SimBrief and I can make adjustments if I choose to do that. And that'll eventually, if you continue to make the same route, more accurate over time. At my top of climb, I was supposed to have 3,034 pounds of fuel, but I had almost 3,300 pounds of fuel at the top of climb. My next point was Atlanta. I was supposed to have 2,851 pounds of fuel, and I ended up having about 3,034 pounds of fuel. So quite a bit of extra fuel. And I actually continue to make fuel all the way. So if this is something that's occurring on a regular basis, and you can see... You know, this flight plan's not doing me a lot of good because it's it's quite inaccurate. What you can go and do is tweak the sim brief package using a tool to increase or decrease the amount of fuel burn overall by a certain percentage. So as we're continuing our way onto the flight, we passed Atlanta, we've gone through Jacksonville, we're 
into Miami. We're getting near our top of descent. We really want to be looking in real life that our fuel that we have on board, our top of descent fuel, is going to be adequate for the amount of flying that we're about to do to get to our destination. Because once we leave the flight levels, we're going to be burning a lot of fuel. So we really want to make sure that our top of descent fuel is going to be adequate for the arrival process and then the actual maneuvering that air traffic control might have us doing. Because your plan might be out the window after air traffic control gets a hold of you and now they have you vectoring all over the place. Or in worst case, you actually shoot an approach, you get down to minimums and all of a sudden there's an obstacle on the runway. There could be, you know, a vehicle that drove on the runway. There could be a, a disabled aircraft. There could be animals on the runway, wildlife, whatever it may be. And now you have to make a very quick decision which is essentially being made for you, to go around and head off to um, execute a missed approach and head off to your alternate destination. In my case, it's going to be Miami. So I have to have enough fuel to be able to fly from Miami, or correction, from Key West to Miami and have a legal amount of fuel when I land. And that gets into a whole other topic of legalities. But for today's discussion, we have to have our trip fuel. So from my case, which we Kilo Charlie Hotel Alpha to Kilo Echo Yankee Whiskey Key West, I have to have 3,662 pounds of fuel. And when I land, I have to have 291 pounds of extra fuel, which is contingency fuel. I have to have 435 pounds of fuel, which is 25 minutes to get over to my alternate of Miami. So if I don't have that amount of fuel on board, I am simply not legal. So my minimum takeoff fuel, once I get to the very, very end of the runway and I've had delays or whatever it may be, my minimum brake release fuel for this flight is going to be 3,542 pounds. So that's three hours and 15 minutes of fuel, of total fuel that I have to have on board. If I don't have that on board, I am not legal. Continuing to look at our Simbri package, which in our case is 39 pages long for my flight between Chattanooga and Key West, I'm going to head past my first five pages and I'm going to get into the wind information. So if I get on page six, which is my wind information, I can see my climb. So as I continue to go through 10,000 feet, through 15,000 feet, 20,000, 31, 35, I can see my wind direction, wind speed, and temperature all the way up. And over each point along my route, I can see Atlanta, Honid, Nikki, all the way through as we discussed. I can see the altitude, the wind, and the temperature for almost all the flight levels going all the way up. And this helps make decisions if I have to move my aircraft from one specific flight altitude to another to avoid turbulence, to avoid uh, excess headwinds and those kind of things. Continuing to head on over to page seven, I can actually see the ICAO flight plan. Once you've done all of the entries into SimBrief, then we actually create a flight plan. This flight plan referred to as the ICAO flight plan is what the air traffic control units are going to receive. And it looks like a whole bunch of coded information. If I head down to looks like this fifth line, I can see that I have my actual route. So my routing is going to be from a specific lat long location, direct to Atlanta, direct to Honid via Q81, which is Quebec 81 airway, to Carter, direct Giggy, and then direct to the airport from there. And then I've got a whole bunch of other information about the type of radio systems I have, a navigation system on board. That's all in my IKL flight plan. If I continue to go to page nine, I start to get into areas where weather is a concern. If I was really doing this in real life, I would have a lot of things to look at. I had a number of significant meteorological events that were occurring along the way. Um, I knew that the weather was bad, certainly where I was taking off from in the morning. And I knew the weather wasn't too great in Chattanooga. And that's why I was getting out of there and heading to Key West. And I can see, just for example, I have areas that were high level convective sigmets, which is convective storm activity, thunderstorms, that kind of thing. I'll just read this one example. 
example, it says tops above flight level 450, tornadoes, hail to 1.5 inches, wind gusts to 70 knots possible. So as we continue to go through our routing, we're going to look at each flight information region and see all the concerns that are happening in each region. So in the Atlanta region, the area I'm trying to get out of Dodge, literally, um, I have high tops up to 31,000 feet. So I have clouds extending from lower levels all the way up through to 31,000 feet, and they're convective and they're thunderstorms in other areas where there could be tornadoes. So again, we really need to get out of this area. Heading down into the nice Miami area, I do have continued convective segments, which are pretty normal because there's, you know, pretty much storms there every afternoon. But you can see that there are storms that are occurring over the ocean and moving on land with very high wind gusts and that kind of thing, which could be a concern if I'm, you know, coming into an area, you know, in my case, Key West, maybe there's storms in the area. I want to be concerned about that. So segments, significant meteorological. Jacksonville actually was having an area where there's severe thunderstorms moving from a specific point, tops above 45,000 feet, level 450, tornadoes, hail to 1.5 inches, gust to 70 knots possible. So kind of a repeat of the other one. So these are significant issues. And if you're flying in Microsoft Flight Simulator and you have real world weather turned on, hey, you might actually get some of this stuff. So it might be a good thing to check out. Continuing on to page 10, I have continued weather information. I have uh, information about if, if I take off out of my Chattanooga airport and I lose an engine right away, well, I can't go back to the airport possibly because of low weather. I have been given departure alternates. So the departure alternate that I was given for Chattanooga was Nashville International. And I can look at the weather and I can kind of determine, is this a good idea or not? Now, if I'm looking at the forecast, I can actually see things like winds 320 at nine knots, one mile, light freezing rain and mist, overcast 900. So in real life, if that was really my going to be my departure alternate, I might want to pick another one. My destination alternate, Miami International, pretty beautiful day there. There was some showers that were forecasted, but plus six statute miles, vicinity of showers, but high ceilings, um, broken 4,500 seems to be the ceiling. Everything is scattered below that. Continuing on, we look into uh, beyond the weather now. We're actually starting to look at things uh, that are concerning the flight, either from outages of system equipment for navigation purposes, could be uh, runway conditions or what Whatever it may be that require a notice to airmen, a no tam. So we have on page 11 um, all of the significant, significant no tams that are affecting my departure airfield, which is level. There's some non standard markings, there's some uh, approach lighting, PAPI. Uh, on runway zero two is US. So I might decide, well, am I using, you know, that runway or is that a concern? The ILS runway, runway two zero, which is the opposite of the one I'm going to be taking off. The outer marker beacon is actually not operating. My departure airdrome, you know, doesn't have too, too much to be concerned about. My arrival airdrome, which is Key West International, there appears to be some uh, communications frequencies that are not operational. So my voice is not operational. I appear there's to be a taxiway that's closed. Um, there is a part of a runway that's closed. So in real life, if you don't look at these things and you arrive at the airport and all of a sudden you decide to land on a runway that's closed and you have an accident, there's going to be real big percussions, repercussions for you. So these are really, really important. Continuing on here, you can see that um, runway 0927 um, is, it says it's exclusive to air carriers. I'm not really sure what that means. Uh, there are specific approach people procedures that have been amended, uh, specific procedures that would have to be used um, in the event that... So continuing on here, looking at Key West, there's um, some procedures that have been amended uh, specifically for runway 27 and runway 09. So things like uh, minimum altitudes have been changed, um, missed approach procedures have been changed. And this is stuff that would be briefed to the crew or both crew members would be aware of this before, before departure or certainly before arrival. Um, detailed information about uh, Nashville is on here. That was our departure alternate. Um, there's a whole bunch of information about um, the Nashville area. 
It's a very, it's reviewing no TAMs takes a long time and it, you have to determine what's really important because if you start looking at every single thing and you do have to look at everything, but if you look at things that are going to affect your flight, it's not going to be the tower that is two miles away from the airport that's 300 feet, doesn't have a light on it. It's going to be something like the runway is not, is not operational or an ILS is out of use or whatever it may be. So skimming through these things and doing your very best to determine if things are going to be usable or not usable upon your arrival are, is really, really important. Um, continuing on, I'm now on page 21 of 39. Continuing on, no TAMs after no TAMs after no TAMs. We've already talked about the weather. There's some major, major no TAMs are in the area for uh, hazardous areas, including operations in the spaceport area, uh, Cape Canaveral. There's areas that are for the Falcon 9 space launch facility. And I mean, this is page after page after page of information in, in real life. You know, you got to look at, you got to re review all of this information and see if it's pertinent. There is other information uh, that's added in by our company in this case here. We can see that our, our cost index or our cruise fuel information, it talks about using auto for that and why we would and would not want to use that. There's our, a nice, beautiful picture of our flight route and showing lat and long in our different points. It shows along our entire route. So this, this could be a, a pretty major issue for this particular flight, but it says embedded cumulonimbus up to 42,000 feet. So that, that could be a pretty big issue. Definitely want to make sure you got radar on that flight. And if that wasn't working, you might have to decide, you know, you're not going to do the flight. Uh, we have other things, including turbulence profile. We have wind charts along the route to expect turbulence all of these things. So this package is 39 pages long and to make it as realistic as possible, it's long as the real one would be. So, I mean, you just don't show up to the airport and, you know, spend five minutes and go because you're legally bound to everything that's in this package and you have to agree to it. And as a matter of fact, you sign it at the front and it says, I hereby confirm that I have performed a thorough self-briefing about the destination and alternate airdromes of this flight, including the applicable instrument approach procedures, airport facilities, no TAMs and all other relevant particular information signed the pilot. It is on the pilot. So that's a little bit about, well, actually that's quite a bit about SimBrief, kind of looking at how to make a package, how to interpret the package. And there's a lot more that we could get into. I think it's a really good way for a brand new flight sim enthusiast or pilot to get into flight planning for themselves and to make it as realistic as possible. Thank you for coming along for the ride today and learning about flight planning and simbrief.com. I would like to invite you back next week as we talk about turboprop operations and all of the information that comes along with that, including the difference between torque and ITT and performance. So if you're a TBM 930 operator in the flight sim world, there's a lot of things you're going to learn about next week that you might be surprised about. Come back and check out turboprop operations. And in the following weeks, we're going to be looking at jet operations in a lot of detail. I want to invite you once again to foxtrotalphaaviation.ca. We have many things for you to check out, including our unique aviation-themed store, Foxtrot Alpha Aviation logo gear, and our loud and smoky design Boeing 727 gear. Check out hoodies, great for the cold weather we're currently experiencing, t-shirts, jackets, etc., all available on our site. If you are interested in blogs, please check out our blog section on foxtrotalphaaviation.ca. If you feel like you'd like to support this show and our many goals to bring you ways to level up your flight simulation experience, please consider joining us on Patreon. Today's podcast featured music from audionautics.com. Also featured in today's podcast is music from Vimeo and sound effects by Zap Splat. Thank you very much for joining us today on Foxtrot Alpha Aviation. See you in the virtual skies soon.